Hey guys, today in the podcast, we have Brad Long, founder of Zero Debt Coach. How are you, Brad? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, not too bad. Living the dream, loving life, all that jazz, you know? Right. Um, so why don't you tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself um, and the company that you have? Yeah, great. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, yeah, so I am, yeah, the Zero Debt Coach. I'm basically a Dave Ramsey Master Certified Financial Coach. And I uh, became a financial coach a little over a decade ago on the tail end of eliminating $43,000 worth of consumer debt. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, pretty, it was a pretty uh, celebratory time of a pretty major ordeal of getting out of that uh, $43,000 in two and a half years. Yeah. So yeah. I, I had gotten into that debt basically as the result of a career change, I had shifted from the corporate sphere into being more of a, a contract musician. And I just wasn't, you know, like 78% of the population that lives paycheck to paycheck. I just wasn't, pay, I wasn't prepared uh, from a budgetary standpoint, from an emergency fund standpoint. So that, you know, just caused me to go into, um, you know, debt over the course, very quickly over the course of three years, I had basically taken out a home equity line of credit or a HELOC as my emergency fund. Right. And, you know, while I was making that transition from, you know, more of an, an upper middle class lifestyle into kind of starting at the bottom of a, you know, a very challenging career to make money in at first, uh, I just got way, way behind. And so I hit, I hit rock bottom. I discovered Dave Ramsey's material, um, started listening to his radio show, devoured his stuff. It, it really just intersected with my life at the perfect time. And so uh, I just, I basically used my, continued to use my music career as a side hustle. And I went back into the corporate space doing a software as a service sales job. Hmm. And I was able to, you know, really using those principles just strangle that $43,000 worth of debt in two and a half years. And immediately, I think, you know, I started getting really excited about sharing that idea and that journey with people. So I started buying his books and giving them to people and teaching people how to do budgets. And so, yeah, it was just a natural outgrowth of my excitement of getting to the other side of debt freedom that, you know, took me there. Well, that's awesome. I mean, 43,000 is definitely nothing to scoff at. Um, no. So I guess my first question is, well, A, this is going to be a semi-unrelated thing, but just out of curiosity, um, musician, what do you play? I'm a guitar player, primarily. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, like bass or, or any Electric, of them? acoustic. Yeah, I, I wound up doing, um, it's a great question because I wound up going into a lot of studio work. So I was multi, multi-instrumentalist and I was also a vocalist at the time too. Okay. But yeah, I, I mean, you kind of had to kind of eke out an existence in that world. You kind of have to be pretty versatile, but mm-hmm. guitar was my primary. Um, so in regards to the whole like uh, Dave Ramsey thing. So I've read a few of his books, but I haven't like delved super deep. Like I'm not, you know, like uh, subscribed to his talk show or anything like that. When it comes to, to that sort of thing, A, I know you said that you became a certified uh, coach under his uh, umbrella or his establishment. So mm-hmm. that's awesome. How did you go about doing that? Is that an actual like, um, you know, 50 hour program or something that you did mm-hmm. online? Did you have to go to a, a particular space and do it in person? What was that like? Yes. Uh, at the time that I did it, uh, I, I had been back in the corporate world for several years, again, in a different incarnation of my career mm-hmm. uh, after I kind of walked away from music. And uh, I knew that I wanted to get out of that. So in t- fast forward to 2017. 2007 was when I got out of completely out of debt. So fast forward another decade, you know, I've been sort of coaching people on the side and kind of building my skill set. And yes, so Dave Ramsey does have a master certified financial coaching program that you go through, that you can go through, pay about $2,000 to go through it. And at the time when I went through it in 2017, it was actually an on-premise course. There there were, it was 90 days, but about four days were on their campus. And so you would go and sit through classes and uh, now it's all online, of course, uh, as as most things are these days. Uh, but yeah, so I went through that course. It doesn't really necessarily, there's, I don't have any affiliation with them. It's just mm-hmm. a course that I went through. There is a subscription service that you can be a part of where they send you leads and stuff like that. But I mean, essentially, um, I went through the program, so I have the designation. I can legally use that. 
Right. It doesn't mean any, it's not like a series seven or a series six for, you know, uh, financial advisors or an insurance license or anything like that. But it just, it does give a little bit of street cred in the industry. Right. And so I've definitely used that as, as leverage, but essentially, yeah, I'm in, I'm completely independent of that organization. It's just, I can kind of say that I've been trained under that philosophy. Um, so when you, cause you've used the term like financial advisor, um, financial coach, things like that kind of. Is it interchangeably? And also, I guess, like at the root of it, what does, what does that mean to a layman like myself? Great question. Yeah, we get that question a lot. So I appreciate you asking it. Um, so the difference between a financial coach and a financial advisor, a financial advisor is going to be someone that you think of that is, you know, like a financial plan, like a certified financial planner <clears throat> or a stockbroker. They are, you know, more in the realm of they have certain designations. They have to pass a, like a Series 7 exam, a Series 6 exam, and they're registered to sell securities with the, um, the uh, FTC. I think it's the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and, and so, you know, essentially, it's a much more, they're much more sales oriented typically. Now, to be fair, there are financial advisors that do coach. Um, so the difference between a financial advisor and a financial coach, which is what I am, is I really we really see ourselves as more of educators. Okay. We don't have products to sell. Like I can't sell unless I go get the licenses for them. I can't sell insurance. I can't fi sell financial instruments or securities or anything like that. My role really is to teach my students how to think about money. I teach them financial organization, getting on a written budget, eliminating their debt, and then. In our, in, you know, in our business, we have a big focus on moving on to financial independence or FI as it's, as it's commonly called these days. So big difference, um, you know, I, in my mind, I think the big difference is that for the most part, you know, a financial coach that's a good financial coach is really oriented around teaching, you know, their students how to think about financial instruments Whereas I think uh, a financial advisor is going to be more in a sales role of trying to put them in certain financial instruments. In regards to that, I guess the, when you talk about your, your clients or your customers, um, when they come to you, I'm assuming they're coming to, they're coming to you from a place of, um, I don't want to use the word desperation because that's not the right word, but they're coming from a place of like, basically the a feeling that they are trapped or feeling that they are, you know, uh, they don't know what the next step is in order to get them past where they're currently at, which is drowning in debt. I, mean, I would imagine mm -hmm. the majority of the people who work with you feel that way. Um, sort of like cops, like they don't ever have a good job. You know, like people are only calling them when there's an issue, you know? So yeah. when you get that, I guess, A, what do you see on average? Like at what point does a person start actually asking you for your services? Like, do you see a numerical, like when they're starting to reach like 10,000 in debt or is it just an emotional thing? And then I guess like, how easy is it to work with people in general? Like what are some of their objections? And, and you know, I'm sure that people, some people feel like a Gucci bag is a necessity versus others yeah. that, you know what I'm saying? So like, what, yeah, what would that be? Yeah. So, um, there is a, a broad spectrum of different postures that people come to us in. And the, the most success that we get with our students are the ones that are the most sick and tired of being sick and tired, as Dave Ramsey always likes to say. And, and I, can, I can sort of project that onto, um, or I can reflect that from my own personal situation. When I got to that point where I was $43,000 in debt, and I had less than $2,000 left in my bank account and I didn't know what was going to happen. I was at, I had reached that point where I was like, you know what? I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, but I'm going to get out of it. So there has to be sort of a, a resolution sort of on a mental and like a spiritual and emotional kind of level mm -hmm. where they're, we're going to get the best results. And that's my job as a coach is to get them results. We're going to organize those finances so that we can't, and that, believe me, that is, uh, you know, people talk about getting on a written budget. That's one step, but a lot of times you got to get your finances organized before you can even put them into a budget. And that would be listing out all of your bills, all of your expenses, all of your debts so that we can list those, you know, in a, in a pretty orderly fashion into a budget. So, yeah. So to answer your question, I mean, that, you know, it's a broad spectrum of 
you know, it's a wide range of different, you know, postures that people come to us in. And it doesn't have to be desperation. It could be that, you know, I would say many of our students that we've worked with in the past, it's not a question of they don't make, you know, they don't make enough money. They just don't know where it goes. You know, they don't have any kind of financial discipline or anything like that. And that statistic that I throw out all the time, 78% of the population lives paycheck to paycheck. We're tempted to think like, oh, oh, that's just, you know, they must be below, you know, $30,000 a year. No, it's actually a lot of our students make over $100,000 a year. One, one couple, um, as an example, you know, $13,000 a month in take-home pay, and they spent every dollar of it, every cent of it every month. Yeah. Didn't even have $1,000 as an emergency fund. So, some variation of that is is how people come to us. And so, our job is to really you know, challenge them when, you know, when I first have a meeting with a, with a student, I'm listening for, well, what is your why? Like, why are we having this conversation? You know, yeah. and, and, you know, what is your why and what are your beliefs around money? What are you looking to change? What's the transformation that you're trying to make? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I can definitely relate to that. Like when, um, cause right now we're in Hawaii and when my wife and I were in um, Texas, I was, uh, making six figures because I was in, having a, a corporate sales job and then she's in the military. So she's, you know, nothing to scoff at because most of our stuff was uh, taken care of in terms of rent and a lot of food allowances and things like that. So like there was a big benefit to her being in and plus she had a paycheck. So, oh, um, yeah. but even with all that, it was, as you were saying, like when we first moved to Texas from that point to us leaving to coming back to Hawaii, our bank account did not grow like almost at all, like maybe a thousand dollars. And it was purely because we were just spending money and doing things. And, and looking back, it's like, what, what were we even spending money on? But a lot of it was restaurants. Um, granted to some extent, I, I felt, um, I felt like I needed to take care of, uh, like my parents and things like that. And not just from a, like actually take care of them, but from just like a, a non-frugal way from just uh, just throwing things at them like i, I got them you know uh, temper pedics and and big screen tvs and new couch sets and all sorts of other crap that just they didn't need it they didn't even ask for it i just would randomly walk in one day and be like oh i don't like this couch let's get rid of it let's get you something else you know and, and it was silly things like that or buying cars and then be like oh i want the next model and oh i want the next model you know and things like that that just consistently put us to where I had to make X amount of dollars. And then of course we had our mortgage and things like that, where it's just like, you know, I don't even know what, I completely feel for the people who are currently in the, the COVID crisis uh, because I, I don't know what I would have done if this would have impacted my job in Texas. I would have been, we would have been completely screwed. We had a little bit of a nest egg, but I mean, that would have been right. good for maybe a month or two. And then after that, you know, we would have been, coming close to zero and I have a son and I, you know, like there's a lot of issues where I'm like, I don't even know what to do. And the bigger part being that me, myself, I, I have a, uh, a predisposition to getting sick because I have uh, chronic asthma. And so mm-hmm. like, Oh wow. There's the, wow. Yeah. So there's a scary element to it's it of like, if I catch something absolutely. like this, you know, even though I should be theoretically fine because I'm relatively fit, I can still, I still exercise and stuff, but I, I just the fact that I have it and it can attack my lungs and things like that. Like, I would literally have to choose between possibly risking dying and being exposed to this thing all the time or a mortgage payment, you know? And I think that's where a lot of people don't want to be in their life. They want to be able to have financial freedom and some sort of financial control. Yes. So do you think, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to, you know, kind of piggyback on what you were saying, you know, with, you know, you talked about some modicum of financial freedom and with freedom comes incredible responsibility as, as we all know. Yeah. And so th- the posture that I try to, and the mindset that I try to coach my students into is mm-hmm. that personal finance is a lot like warfare. You know, you have all of these entities that are outside of you that are trying to get into your pockets, like the, what I call the marketing industrial complex. And the financial, you know, industry in terms of like, you know, Jim, you got Jim Cramer at CNBC, you know, and the financial pundits and your real estate agent and your, your financial advisor telling you, you know, you got to do this, you got to do this. 
And then you've got this phenomenon of, you know, what used to be keeping up with the Joneses, which I would argue now is keeping up with the Gateses because everything is so hyper consumption. Everything is luxury. We have to have bigger houses and more luxurious cars. And then you have the factor of us, you know, just our own lack of contentment. Right. And if you know, so you have all these sort of warfare factors working against you that if you don't have a plan for your money, somebody else does. You know, so if you're not on a budget and that budget is not your, you know, the, the organizing center of truth around your financial life, then you are succumbing to the whim of your own discontentment or of your own trying to keep up with the Joneses. Mm. You know, and, and so that's really, you know, to really win with money requires a mindset shift and it also requires a lot of behavior shift. And that can be accomplished with a written budget for sure. I've seen it happen many times. So do you think it's actually more of a, um, do you, would you say it's a, an, an individualized mindset? Because I'm thinking there could be some sort of maybe even cultural or societal, um, I guess, a manipulation, I suppose you could say in terms of your finances, like where you're, where you come from as I'll give you just a very brief example. I'll let you kind of run with that. Sure. I, myself, um, I was not from a, a wealthy place. You know, I lived in a gang infested area when I was growing up in Latin Kings and all sorts of other things going on. Uh, you know, I'd see people getting jumped and stuff all day, every day. It just was part of my life. So seeing that, and then we talk about finances, anytime my father wasn't like this because, you know, I mean, he was incredibly hardworking. I mean, in like every cent had to go to us for, you know, and he, and he made sure mm -hmm. of that. Um, but he was also a laborer that was working and he still works as, as a laborer at almost 60, making $12 an hour, breaking his back. You know I mean? Like it's nuts. And, um, but anyways, to bypass that, I would see all the time people who would come into money, whether that was through positive means or not at, in my neighborhood. And the first thing they would do is spend it on, you know, rims to put on their car or sound systems or these, all these frivolous things, which at the time in our little bubble made them, you know, awesome and made them, you know, quote unquote, like big ballers or whatever, you know, like, but yeah. then looking at it now, obviously they didn't, they were still living in this shack of a house that was still in a crime infested area that was still, you know, like they, but they'd always make sure they had the, the, the freshest clothes and the, and the whitest shoes. And yet they yeah. were still very obviously living in, in poverty, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So do you think there's some tie in there? Like, do you find, some of your clients maybe do they ever have that like hesitation where they do feel that whether it, it doesn't have to be obviously so dramatic, but like they just say, I can't get rid of this Porsche SUV. I have to have it because my neighbors have it and the neighborhood mm -hmm. has it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And the answer to that, the, 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 the answer to that is really a question is, can you afford it? You know, and that's really something that is missing from the vernacular of our culture now yeah. because credit is so easy because you can go get a credit card. You can go get a personal loan. They'll throw a car loan at you or a mortgage at you, whether you can afford it or not. Right. So it really goes back to, uh, and I can relate to, you know, where you're coming from because we, you know, my, uh, I was raised by my mother and I have two younger brothers. Um, and, you know, my mom was very frugal, but it was, yeah, we were, we were pretty poor. And so frugality, and I, I grew up knew, knowing, you know, how money should work and that you need to be, you know, you need to be reserved about it. But I lost a lot of that when I went off to college and I kind of started absorbing a lot of those middle-class attitudes about, okay, you're always going to have a car payment. You're always going to have a mortgage. You're always going to have and, and so part of this kind of awakening that a lot of people have because of pain, because they've gotten themselves into financial pain, is just this idea that, you know, you, 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 it, can you really afford it? You know, and that's a question that you have to start asking yourself. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, if you can afford it, is this the next wise purchase for me? And really, this, again, comes back to the, the, uh, the budget. It comes right. back to what your goals are. It comes back to what your budget is. And, and so, 
you know, if, if, you know, rims and, and tires and, you know, that kind of stuff is, is, is important to you. There's nothing morally wrong with, you know, doing that stuff, sure. but it's, it's one thing if your if your spending is out of whack in one area and you're living in a hovel, you know, that, that's just, that's, a, that's a lack of discernment. That's a lack of wisdom. And you have to very carefully um, reassess like what, you know, what, what are my goals here? And yeah. There is, if through this process, it was the same for me. I think it is for everybody that's, you know, maybe they have a lot of debt. Maybe they make plenty of money. Maybe they don't. But there's this, this transformation that has to happen in the way that you think about money and the way that, you know, your cash flows go. And again, I, I really, you know, the bu- your budget is really should be the dictating factor of what you can spend money on and what you can't spend money on. It's almost as though... And, and so many of our students that have gone through this process, all of them say, you can't do it without a budget. It's yeah. almost like in your external brain for money. Mm-hmm. Because if, if you think that you can control your spending and you can, you know, you can rein things back, I mean, you're sadly mistaken. I was mistaken. All of my students that have gone through you know, coaching with us or any of our digital courses, say, they all say the same thing. If you think you can do it without a budget, you're fooling yourself. Yeah. And so it, the, the, the main remedy for all of this stuff that we're talking about is a shift in mindset and then making sure that your, your financial life is dictated by your budget. So just so that I was thinking about, and maybe you've um, encountered this, maybe not, I don't know, I don't know, but going back a little bit to the mindset, do you also have any, have you ever had any issues with, with clients that maybe has something closer to a retail addiction, you know, because I feel like it's, it's almost like a food addiction in terms of like, you need it to survive. It's not, it's not a drug that you have to actually go out and purchase like food you have to consume. So it's a weird addiction. So I see like, I feel like with retail, it's not obviously quite the same, but like you may need to get a new dress or something for a, right. an event or something and then you just start to spend a little extra and then a little extra and you just get back into the habit of swiping and not thinking yes that is a great point and i would argue i would take it even further and i would say that that 78 percent of the population that lives paycheck to paycheck there is some modicum of addiction in that for yeah. for most people and it is it's just because This context that we're in, you know, I talked about earlier about keeping up with the Joneses is what it used to be called. I think it should be called keeping up with the Gateses. And I actually got that phrase from this uh, short documentary on YouTube called The Overspent American. Uh, And I can shoot you a link to that. Fantastic, fantastic documentary that talks about uh, this Harvard PhD, Juliet Shore is her name. And she goes through, she did this study on just the, the, the overarching consumption patterns and how they have increased and how they've gotten more out of control in the past few decades in particular to where, you know, now, you know, in the, in the area that my wife and I live in, in Atlanta, Georgia, it's like the average new house and a new subdivision is five bedrooms with a three car garage. And, you know, there are two people living in it and, you know, one car is a Mercedes and the other one's a Lexus or Land Rover, whether, you know, you know, so if, if those, if those numbers play out that almost eight out of 10 people walking around live paycheck to paycheck, probably it's true in those subdivisions as well. And so you just have to, you know, it's, it's this overconsumption and, you know, living beyond people's means to where when we do have a crisis like this, people get freaked out. Whereas, you know, if, if they're making six figures and they're living well within their means, spending less than they make and living on a budget, then they should have plenty of reserves on which to, to live and thrive, you know, because there are one of the great things about being debt free and, you know, on your way to financial independence, wh- when something like this happens is that there are opportunities, cash is king, right, you know? Right. And so that's another sort of mindset that we kind of coach our students into as we get them through the debt elimination process, we start getting the them thinking in terms of five years to 10 years down the road when they're out of debt and they're actually, instead of paying interest on debt, they're earning interest on other people's debt or or other types of investments. So that actually brings up a good point because since you can't actually be a financial advisor in terms of selling, um, you know, insurance or selling stocks and bonds and whatnot, indexes, um, can you, when you are coaching people, 
Is it a role of, and I, I, I mean this in, in obviously an incredibly respectful way to your career. Does, is it in a role of like, I'm a therapist first in terms of the mindset. Mm-hmm. And then the answer at the end is that I'm going to help you set a budget and save. Or do you also, um, again, I know you can't actually recommend something in terms of like, I can say, I can do this for you, but do you also say like, Hey, now that you have a little nest egg, do you, um, let, let's start looking at talking to someone, another financial advisor to, for mm-hmm. stocks and bonds and whatnot. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a really, you know, great way of putting it. And, and so again, you know, what we're doing as coaches is we're teaching them how to think critically. Mm-hmm. We're not telling them, we're not teaching them what they, sh- what investment vehicles they should be in, which markets they should be in, which, um, you know, asset classes they should be in. I will share with them what I'm doing. I will make recommendations as to asset classes that I think they would be a good fit for. Like, you know, some people, um, some people can be landlords. Some people can, I, that's not something I think I could ever do. I just, I don't have the makeup for that, you know? So we can make recommendations for asset classes to look, you know, for them to look at. And then certainly I do have some financial advisors that I know, like, and trust that I know will buttress the, the things, the principles that I've taught them, you know, but essentially what we're doing and what, you know, what I want to do and what I think what needs to happen in our culture is people have to get back to learning how to think critically and learning how to think for themselves and not trusting a financial advisor. You should never trust your money. I, I tell people, you know, I tell our students like, don't, don't trust me. I just want to give you the tools to where you can make decisions for yourself because mm-hmm. you're the only one that really knows what's in your own best interest. Now I can right. steer clear of certain things and, um, but that's really, and it's an ongoing process because, you know, personal finance is incredibly personal, but it's also, especially once you get to the financial uh, investment phase, it can be really, really complicated, right. but right. there are just some guiding principles that if you follow those, it doesn't matter what, uh, investment vehicles that you're in, you're gonna you're gonna win because you've you've built up this posture of budgeting and living living between in in your means and um, you know s- you know increasing your savings rate and things like that. So just uh, something I was thinking of while you were talking about that is again you know throughout this we've re- you've referenced obviously a mindset shift in, in teaching people and then we started talking a little bit about our own personal history and how that's kind of affected the way we look at money today. One thing you mentioned was, um, you know, living with your mother and that you came from an area for that was, um, you know, you, you were poor and you're using your words. And then mm-hmm. once yeah. you got out, you started, you know, spending money anyways. Yep. So do you think, so you grew up in that environment, but you weren't, ne- you weren't, and that, correct me if I'm wrong, of course, but you weren't necessarily taught um, how to save money. Is that, would that be right. correct? That's totally correct. Yes. We didn't talk, didn't talk about money. Yeah. So would you, would you say, and this is just something I'm thinking about right now, would you say it's, it's important today in today's culture? um, And maybe this is even something you can think about for yourself to expand in possibly is, is like learning, teaching our kids how to save and, and to change that mindset set mindset shift of, I want a toy today, especially as kids are constantly now on tablets and iPhones and they're being bombarded with free ads to download this new game and all these other things that they're just, it's an instant gratification issue that has just uh, been exacerbated through technology. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I think that that's really, you know, personal financial literacy has to start at home and it should start in childhood. Yeah. And, you know, I hear a lot of talk about, you know, we need to have programs in schools and it needs to be in the education system, which, you know, I don't disagree with that, except for the people usually making that argument have something to do with the credit card companies or financial institutions that want to teach that stuff and they have their own agenda. Right. So, yes, I agree that it starts in the home and it's it's us as parents, you know, we as parents that have to teach the the principles of how money works. You know, it's not just this magic pixie dust that falls off trees that, you know, manifests an iPad from the Amazon, yeah. the Amazon fairy, you know, there it's, it requires, you know, work and investment and an exchange of value to acquire, you know, that currency that you mm-hmm. then can get, you can save a portion, 
you can give a portion right. and you can invest a portion or you can, sp- I'm sorry, spend a portion. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I you, get got, it. you got buckets in other words. Right, right. So when people have worked with you, what sort of, um, what have they been able to achieve? Like what, what are some maybe not necessarily testimonials. I'm not like throwing that up on, on, you know, it's not a commercial, but sure. you know, like, yeah, what do you, what is, what do you see happen a lot of the times when they work with you? Yeah. The biggest transformation is usually, especially the ones that get success in their own process, the fastest are the ones that are sold out to the process. I have a, a, just a, a system that I worked them through called the eight steps to erase debt. And that's a free, you know, that's a free guide on our, our website. And it's basically just these, you know, it's the same principles that Dave Ramsey teaches. They're a little bit more granular in terms of how I've had, I've gotten success in, in coaching different uh, students over the years. But one of the biggest things, and I'll just give an example. Um, there's uh, this student of ours, Isles Harrington, and, and just did an interview with her on my YouTube channel about a month ago. And she just finished paying off $59,000 worth of student loan debt mm-hmm. in two and a half years. So she actually bested me. But one of the things that, that, she, that she talks about in that interview, which I think is just goes back to the point that I've been making since the very beginning, is two things got her across the finish line. Her why, which was bigger than just the debt, mm-hmm. and uh, living on a budget. You know, and so the the two I'd say you know those are the two biggest things, and the 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 biggest low hanging fruit for most of our students is just reducing the overwhelm and reducing the chaos in their financial situation by getting their finances organized so that we can can get them into a budget. So it's that transformation, and they really really have to want it because it is really hard to change those habits, really hard. And they, so they really have to have that why. That's why we keep going back to that. Obviously, you're helping them create a budget. You're helping them shift their mindset. You're helping them learn what they, they can save by showing them all these numbers. Do you actually, do you also go, um, I don't know if, or this would might be more closer towards a, an advisor role, um, but do you actually like also go through their, for example, their credit cards and be like, well, these actually have super low interest or they're no interest. So let's consolidate these cards or let's do, mm-hmm. let's leave those alone and not pay those debts off necessarily and focus on these debts. And you know what I'm saying? Like things that are yeah. a little bit higher. Yeah, end. no, we get, we get in the weeds. That's, that's, um, so my coaching process is I, I always do a, a free 30 minute call initially with a new, a new prote- perspective student just to listen to their story see what they might need help with, yeah. you know, just get into some of the granular, granulars of it. But then also for me as a coach, I'm listening to, are they coachable? Do they have a why, a strong enough why? Are they sick and tired of this? And, you know, am I going to be able to help them? Right. And if the answer is yes, then our first session is usually a two hour deep dive where we just talk about, all right, what's your why? What are your beliefs around money? You know, what are some of the things that we need to work on? And then we jump straight into the numbers and that's yeah. where we go through it. You know, we, we, their homework assignment is to list out all of their debts, expenses, and um, bills. And then we plug those together. Uh, we plug those into a budget together. And the credit cards and all kinds of debt instruments are uh, a part of that conversation. Now, to, to talk about what you, you know, to, to kind of address what you're talking about in terms of what to pay off first, we recommend the debt snowball method. Um, be- what is that? The debt snowball method is basically where you list your debt smallest to largest in amount, regardless of interest rate. Okay. And there are actually some studies shown. I just wrote a blog post on this that's get, that's what, that'll publish next month. Um, there are actually studies, academic studies, that show that that method vis-a-vis versus the, uh, the debt avalanche method, which is where you pay off the highest interest rate first. Uh, people get more traction and have more success with the snowball method than they do the avalanche method. So, oh, and, the re- and the reason is, is that, you know, this issue is not, you know, personal finance is not, um, it's not really a money problem. It's a behavior problem. Hmm. And so you have to, you have to get traction and momentum and, and some success in order to want to keep that ball rolling and get that snowball, you know, paid off. So, right. That, that worked for me. It's worked for, you know, hundreds of students that we've coached through the process. 
And so that's, yeah, the debt snowball method is is absolutely the, the key. Now, there are some certain situations where if somebody's got a ridiculously high, um, you know, car uh, interest rate or a credit card interest rate, we sure. will look at, you know, transferring that, you know, we're not, it, it's not, we're not militant about that necessarily, but generally speaking from a principal standpoint, paying those off from smallest to largest is the fastest way you're going to do it. That makes total sense. Um, Cause so I, I have, a, um, I come from a, a psychology background from, uh, from college and whatnot. And that makes sense because it's almost a, like a Pavlonian like principle, like it, it you're, yeah. you're getting this small little win with the smallest debt first absolutely, and you're absolutely. knocking it off and you get that dopamine release and you get that yeah. ability to say, I did it. I did something. And then right. from there you have an extra goal to, to kind of assess and, and go with. Like I, yeah. I do something very similar to with my son and not to make it sound like I experiment on it, but like whenever we're like, uh, I was trying to get him to do homework and he hated doing homework in the morning. So I noticed that if I let him like watch TV or something in the morning, the rest of the day, he would fight me for homework. But if I made him do it in the morning, the rest of the day was easy. So what I started doing was every time he would get through a page, I'd give him a piece of chocolate. Hmm. And it was just like this continuation. And then eventually I replaced the chocolate with something less caloric and less sugary, but I, I knew that he really loved the chocolate. And so it was like a slow decrease in what I gave him. And then eventually I just stopped giving it to him in general. But now he wakes up in the morning and goes and does homework without oh, even asking or whatever. And then he comes and then he, the rest of the day we can mess around and play and yeah. do all this other stuff. You yeah. know, so I feel like it's a similar general it's principle. Absolutely. It's the same. It's the exact world. same principle because it does, you know, we have, when we sit down to do a budget for the first time with a student, we just set the expectation like, hey, this is going to be terrible for the first couple of months. You're going to feel like a total failure. You're not going to remember stuff. You're going to get confused. It's going to be overwhelming. It's going to take about 90 days, Yeah. you know, but we encourage them to rewrite it, you know, track their expenses, rewrite it every week, you know, because the more you rewrite the stuff, like you're saying, the more you reinforce that behavior, the more you get to know your numbers, the more your son got to know like, oh, cool, I get this out of the way. And then the rest of the day is awesome. Right. You know, so yeah. it's like you, 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 uh, you do the hard stuff first and then the rest of it. And so it gets to this point where it becomes habitual. Mm -hmm. you know, and then it starts to be fun and then you right. can gamify it, which is essentially what you were doing with your son is you were gamifying the process of homework. And so right. that's absolutely, that's a really great analogy uh, to what we do with our students is we try to make it a, a game in a sense yeah. and get them some wins as fast as possible right. and just celebrate the stew out of the wins, you know? Nice. Well, speaking of wins, I mean, you, you have a, um, a freebie that you wanted to kind of go over the financial crisis survival guide. Uh, I think this one specifically talks, uh, even gives a little bit of help and a little bit of reference to the current uh, pandemic that's going on for those that are affected by it. Um, do you mind talking to me, just uh, giving a few points about um, yeah. what's inside of it? Okay. We are sharing the screen so you can see it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So, this is our financial crisis survival guide. And essentially, just to kind of give you some background as to where this came from, we kind of saw this crisis coming. And so we had had some conversations with some of our current students. And, you know, spoiler alert is that the principles are no different than if we teach somebody that's coming to us to eliminate their debt. Um, right. It's just a reframing of what the principles are based on, you know, a financial crisis. So, a lot of people are, you know, they've gotten their hours reduced, they've gotten laid off or furloughed or maybe terminated, or they're looking at that and they're like, oh no, you know, I, right. I, I, I'm in the middle of a situation I don't want to be in. So as with any of our students and anything that we teach, and I'm sure that this is the same, you know, for you guys with your clients, the main source of value that we provide is reducing overwhelm. You know, so especially in a financial crisis, it's really two crises. It's whatever the crisis is, and it's a financial crisis. So what we want to do is just kind of talk them through, all right, you know, you know, yes, it's okay. You know, the emotional response has to be addressed because that's part of the adjustment process. And, and I'm, you know, I, I'm not in that camp of people where, you know, you just tell people to say, calm down, it's going to be okay. 
No, we have to process through that. And the way that we process through that is with a very succinct plan. So, you know, I say a little bit about that in, um, you know, the beginning of that. And essentially, this is going to seem a little bit oversimplified. But again, this is all about, you know, reducing the overwhelm and helping them to just focus on three very, very important things. So, the three pillars of, you know, of surviving a financial uh, crisis are preserving capital, aggressively ac- obtaining capital, and then getting help, encouraging community as fast as possible. That seems commonsensical, but we'll, we'll break down some of the gram- granulars um, as we kind of go through this. So, sure. uh, you know, economic defense is, you know, pressing pause on paying off debt for most people if they are doing that, focusing on building an emergency fund. Um, and we're saying, you know, try to get to at least three to six months uh, to our, our students that are out of debt. We're saying like, man, get, try to get to a year of emergency of an emergency fund right? Uh, because we just don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how this is going to affect the economy. And as we've seen this un- unwind, you know, it, it's pretty catastrophic for a lot of people. Sure. Um, from a crisis perspective, we have what's called uh, the four walls. So if you're in a place where you've lost your job and you can't pay all of your bills these four walls are what we recommend that you, you know, basically forsake everything else for the time being. And you've got to have housing, you've got to have food, transportation, and clothing. Um, so the four walls are super important. And then we can address the debt and, you know, those payments, you know, a little bit later on. And then the de- next defensive steps, and this is just to kind of help people kind of think through like, okay, if I'm contributing to retirement, I need to stop that. Uh, we get them to make a list of every bill, every expense, and every debt, sort of a pre-budgeting step, uh, press pause on their debt elimination, build a written budget, make sure that they're tracking their expenses, cutting their expenses. And we've got some even more specific resources on how to kind of think through that. Um, and then sell some stuff. You know, we all have stuff in our basement, attic, garage, closet, storage unit. Um, you know, there's stuff that we can get rid of to generate cash. Step number two or or pillar number two is aggressively obtain capital. And that's where you're going to look at side hustles. There's some great resources in here, including a couple of other content creators. Uh, And then the third piece is, you know, getting help, uh, community and encouragement ASAP. We've got a, a private Facebook group that we have that are, that is a part of that. And then I also, anybody that reaches out to us that, you know, is a subscriber or is a student, uh, I always offer a free 30 minute zoom call just to kind of, you know, address their fears and their worries, right. maybe give them some quick, you know, some quick wins that they can do. And, um, you know, just try to be a voice of reason in a very, very chaotic time for them. And then, you know, obviously we're also addressing more of the fear and the panic and, you know, h- how to process through what are called the six stages of awareness, denial sure. and bargaining, fear and anxiety, depression and acceptance. So, yeah. And um, so that's really just, uh, you know, just a basic, just a very basic piece of content, but it's, uh, it's been a very, um, I guess, successful piece of content for us. We've gotten a lot of new people on our email list. I think we got 200 new email subscribers within a month and a half uh, just by putting that out. So uh, super helpful. Yeah. That's awesome. And actually, Brad, can you do me a, a little bit of a favor? Can you, do you mind scrolling down? I think it was the second page. I wanted to ask you a quick question. Okay. Yeah, it was, uh, it was one of these. We were talking about pausing the idea. Okay. So again, press pause on debt elimination for now. Okay. I wanted to talk about that specifically. Um, my first instinct when I read that, I was like, I wonder why he recommends that. And then I started thinking, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. I started thinking, okay, If I was like a personal trainer or something like that, if you tell somebody who just said, I am going to start losing weight, you go, okay, great. Start, you know, tracking what you're eating, whatever. A lot of the times, I know this happened, especially with like with my family, I come from a family that has a lot of um, very heavy people. And so anytime they've tried to go on a Jenny Craig diet or whatever, they'd always come out with this list. And I'm always, I'm looking at it and I'm like, all right, first off, there's no way that your daily calorie in, caloric intake is half of a bagel, you know, a small salad and a yeah. glass of water, you know, at Good the end of the that. day, you yeah. know? And, and so yeah. I think it becomes this falsehood where people go like, Oh, I can't lose weight. I can't build financial freedom, whatever the debt, whatever it is, because look, I haven't spent any money this week and I still am in debt. And it's like, mm-hmm. but all the other times 
and you spend frivolously in all the other in all a bunch of other ways it's just that today right now because we're talking you're trying to uh eliminate the debt but the long term you're you're not basically they're not giving you the ability to actually see their spending habits they're giving you a false narrative on what they spend or you know does that make sense is that something that you see like is that the reason why you put told them to press pause well that's it okay so i see what you're saying yeah so essentially it really depends on the situation and this is where a conversation and probably some coaching is going to be helpful to to help them parse out what do they need to do because it's this is where it gets a little bit a little bit complicated if someone has lost their job or if both spouses have lost their job, so they have zero income right now, Mm -hmm. then yes, we're going to say, okay, you need to press pause on debt elimination right now. If you can continue to make minimum payments, but you may need to, if that's your scenario, then you might have to just focus on the four walls. Mm -hmm. You might have to focus on keeping the lights on, keeping food on the table, keeping transportation. So you can't do all of that and service your debt. If it's somebody, so that's one case. If it's somebody that hasn't lost their job, you know, and things are still kind of rocking along, we might want to tell them to press pause on paying extra on your debt right now and really buttress your emergency fund. You know, continue to make the minimum payments right now, but I really want you to buttress your emergency fund because especially, especially if you're in, you know, somewhat of a vulnerable industry, Mm-hmm. And you see, or you're hearing, you know, the rumblings of there might be layoffs or furloughs down the road. I want you to be prepared for that. Right. And then and a third case would be somebody that's like, you know, they're in a pretty rock solid, you know, maybe like a nurse or a doctor, you know, uh, in that case, you know, their job is probably pretty secure. So we would say, you know, maybe not press pause, you know, but they're not going to be the ones reaching out to us, um, uh, you know, under these auspices, in other words, like this is not a crisis for them. They're just kind of, you know, business as usual. So yeah, the press pause on debt elimination is really, it really depends on the specific set of circumstances. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, Brad. I really appreciate it. Everyone, I I really highly encourage you to take advantage of this freebie and uh, all the stuff that he offers, the free call. Um, It's really important to get your finances in order generally, but especially during the pandemic. So once again, Brad, thank you so much. Uh, Why don't you tell us how we can learn more about you, where we can follow you, et cetera. Yeah, great. Thank you. Again, thanks for having me. Uh, You can find me over at uh, zerodebtcoach.com. We're also on YouTube, uh, Zero Debt Coach. And actually, one of the things that we're doing right now during this crisis is we're going live on YouTube every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hmm. And we're just talking about topics, you know, that are, are relevant right now uh, during this crisis uh, to, you know, just try to help guide people through through it. And, uh, and then obviously we're on Facebook. We have a private Facebook group called uh, Zero Debt Tribe. And, um, or you can reach me at brad at zerodebtcoach.com. Awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate it. And I know everybody else does as well. Um, again, everyone, please look Brad up, um, download those freebies and, uh, you know, get some financial independence in your life. Love it. There you go. Well, thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Take care. All right. right, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.